Hello, I'm Barry Daniel, and this is the podcast of the Middle Way Society. Our aim is to encourage a universal approach to living a more integrated, ethical life, avoiding dogma or any appeal to authority. My guest today is Paul Teed, a member of the Society and a Professor of History at Saginaw Valley State University. He's going to be talking to us today about what history means to him and why it matters. Hello, Paul. Welcome to the MWS podcast. Hi, Barry. It's nice to be here. Okay, Paul. I'd like to start off by asking you to tell us something uh, of your background and basically how you ended up joining the Society. Sure. Uh, Well, I'm from the East Coast uh, of the United States originally. I'm originally from Connecticut. Uh, I grew up uh, in the 1970s and 80s. Uh, I was brought up in in the congregational church tradition, which is a sort of a liberal Protestant tradition. Uh, My grandfather was a a congregational minister, and I gravitated toward uh, academic life. Uh, There were a series of, of questions that... Uh, as a young person, I was very interested in, and I, I came to believe that an academic life would help me to pursue answers to them. Yeah. And I attended New York University in New York City uh, in the 1980s and received my, my bachelor's degree from there and then my master's and Ph.D. from the University of Connecticut. Um, and throughout that whole period, uh, one of the things that um, sort of... Uh, remained with me was a kind of an aversion, I guess you might say, to any form of dogmatic certainty, yeah. whether it was theories of social science or religious dogmatism. Um, and uh, I sort of had struggled with, with that. And of course, living in the United States these days, uh, we have a culture that is in many ways so polarized by dogmatic certainties. Mm-hmm. Um, And so I I began to explore various alternatives to that way of thinking and that way of being. And I found my way to the books of Stephen Batchelor, who has written about, as I'm sure you know, uh, books like Buddhism Without Beliefs or uh, Confessions of a Buddhist Atheist. And it was from Stephen Batchelor's thinking that I found the Middle Way Society and uh, was quite pleased and quite struck by how similar the values of the Middle Way Society were to what I had been kind of thinking about and struggling with for so long. Okay. Um, well, let's move on now to the, the main topic of the talk. Um, how do you define history in, in, in the broad sense? Right. That That's a, a complex and, and I think fascinating question. Uh, not being a philosopher, <clears throat> but rather being a practical or a practicing historian, I guess I come at it from a... Um, a background of experience with actually doing history, but I would say that history is really uh, an attempt to interpret the past through the use of documentary evidence. Um, I, I tend to be wary of, uh, of definitions of history that are too deterministic, um, that say that history is the past or you know, sort of implying that we can in some direct, unmediated way uh, understand the past. Really, I think history, you know, if, as, a, as a practicing historian, I think it's important to start from the point of a, a point of humility and understanding that we have to understand and interpret the past through the surviving documentary evidence, and that often there's great limitations in terms of what we can know about the past. Yeah. So I would say that the, my broad definition is that it's an interpretation or an, an attempt to interpret the past through the use of, of existing documents, although in understanding what documents mean, you know, that can be understood quite broadly, not just written documents, but, but also art uh, and music. Um, and there are many historians who also use archaeological sources, uh, the study of material culture, but it's, it's an interpretive discipline rather than, I would say, a strictly factual discipline. That's sort of the way I understand how historians function. And having, having practiced history for a long time, I, I now am per- perhaps even more humble <laughs> than I was when I started about what can be known directly about the past. Okay. Now, uh, I suppose in relation to that perspective, um, one aspect of middle way philosophy is the understanding that, that people have objectivity and, and not our theories. 
and this objectivity is incremental by nature. Just like we say, um, come on, be a, a bit more objective. So how does this tie in with your concept of objectivity in relation to history? Well, I would say that uh, when I was in graduate school in the 1980s and early 1990s, there were many sort of theoretical constructs that we as graduate students were introduced to or encouraged to use in studying the past. One of them was, of course, Marxist theory. Uh, another was um, sort of behaviorist understandings of history. Uh, and, and in many ways, those theories contained a level of determinism with which I was not very comfortable, although because I was encouraged to use them when I approached the past in my early graduate work, I, I attempted to apply those theories in one way or another to my understanding of the past. And while they were in some respects quite fruitful, one of the things I noticed as I approached the, the evidence is that nearly all, if not all, of the theoretical constructs that I was attempting to use tended to break down when I approached the past and, and, and human beings uh, acting in the past. They tended to break down at the level of individual experience. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and for good or ill, what I ended up doing because of that was I, I, I became more and more convinced that what I was studying was experience itself and the indeterminate nature of human experience. And, and so my dissertation was actually a, a biographical study of uh, a 19th century American anti-slavery activist. And I was very interested in figuring out why he came to the anti-slavery, what drove him to come to the anti-slavery movement. And, you know, the more that I studied him, and, and in the case of, of Theodore Parker, who I looked at, there's a huge amount of evidence, thousands and thousands of letters, detailed journals and diaries. There was no real dearth of evidence, but it became very clear to me that there was no theoretical construct that was going to allow me to kind of pin down in some naively objective way exactly what led him to make what was a very risky decision to become part of a, an unpopular and radical movement, that I had to get into the level of uh, sort of day-to-day -day experience. And so I think, I think that, you know, what I have learned in studying the past is that objectivity comes through um, a, a constant openness to uh, to documents and and the world that they open up. That that really a theoretical or if you will metaphysical starting point is really it can be helpful, but I think it it tends to break down when when you begin to encounter actors in the past. So, do you, do you, in a sense, did you feel that you? Um developed a relationship with this person that or that there was almost a a, a conversation between you or am, am I taking that too far i I don't think that's going too far at all when you read you know thousands of letters and when you read journals that i mean the journals that Theodore Parker kept uh in Boston he lived he was born in eighteen ten and died in eighteen sixty uh and he was a theologian, a very radical theologian. He liked to describe himself as the best hated man in America because of his, his rather unorthodox approach to, to traditional Christian theology. And his diaries really showed me the kind of in, inward personal struggle that he went through in, in, in trying to deal with the very negative response to much of what he was writing. Um, I think you see some of that same kind of struggle in Charles Darwin, for example, who understood, I think, that what the, the ideas that he was developing were, were going to open up controversy and that he would be the subject of some hostility. So in the case of Parker, I was seeing that, and, and it's, it is very much a kind of personal relationship. But one of the tricky parts of that, I think, is that you have to step back a little bit from the person that you're studying, even though you are involved in a kind of relationship with them, in order to, to, to not become sort of captive to their view of the world, if that makes sense. It does, yeah. Um, so we, we're sort of touching on the field of ethics here, um, but by what standards should we judge what makes good or better history as opposed to poor or worse history? Yes, and, and that's such an important uh, question because uh, 
you know, in the world that we live in, there obviously there's a huge amount uh, of uh, printed material available on historical subjects. We also see large numbers of uh, now sort of commercially driven documentaries that are produced on, on television. In the United States, we have the History Channel, which contains all sorts of claims about the past. And But in, in the case of working with students, it's very important to develop some way of uh, of of judging or evaluating historical claims without without assuming that there's some absolute notion of objectivity that as human beings we're capable of arriving at. But I think I think that um, one of the ways, one of the most basic ways to determine what is good or or bad history is what the sources are that are being employed. Yeah. Um, I teach students to, to look at, even though they're somewhat resistant at times, to look very closely at the footnotes of the books they're reading to see whether the claims are based in any kind of actual contact with documentary uh, sources. I also think think that uh, when you're reading a work of history, if we're talking about the printed version here, that it's, it's very reassuring to me when I read historical works where the author is actually willing to acknowledge his or her uh, limitations, uh, his or her you know, particular vantage point or theoretical point of origin in looking at the past. I'm very reassured when I read historians who are open about the limits of what can be known about the subject that they are dealing with. One of the problems, I think, with with documentaries, uh, not all, but with, with, with many documentaries, things that are commercially produced, is that we're, we're taken through the subject by a kind of omniscient narrator, that there's often a reenactment that is that is done as if we are <clears throat> as if we are looking somehow through a time machine at the past without an acknowledgement of the fact that what we are seeing is an interpretive construct. So I would say that the two basic things, and there's a lot of ways to do this, but two basic ways I think is to, first of all to, to really ask some questions about w- what documentary basis this these claims about the past. Are, are constructed from, and then a, a, a willingness of the writer or producer to recognize the limitations of what can be known about the subject. Mm, yeah. Um, on the subject of limitations, I suppose one of the most basic constraints with which any historian begins is, is the mere fact of being situated in time and space. You know, from the current time, one does not have a time-neutral perspective. Do you have, from, from your own experience, um, as an academic, uh, any strategies that, that, that you use that, that have been helpful in that regard? Well, it is, it is so important. I think one of the, uh, one of the, uh, the insights of, of postmodern thought is that what we know is a product in many ways of where we stand. Um, I don't know that there is a perfect way to, to guard against that except a, a certain kind of awareness of, of the fact of it. Um, so that, you know, when I was studying Theodore Parker, or right now, for example, I'm writing, along with my wife, I'm writing a book on the, the Reconstruction period that followed the American Civil War. One of the things that I have tried to do and that we're trying to do as we write this book is to be aware of the tradition of historical writing about the topic. Yes. Yeah. Um, and so, for example, in the case of the Reconstruction period following the Civil War, uh, there has been a very long and controversial uh, tradition of literature that has approached this subject from all sorts of different angles. Um, but one of the things, for example, that has come through to me as we've done the research on that book is that you know, most approaches to the topic have focused pretty exclusively on, political, on a political narrative. They've looked at this through the, the, the lens of you know, what Congress was doing, what the president was doing, or perhaps what the military was doing. And that, you know, one of the things that's really, you know, opened the period up is that we have begun to look at the past and past, in in this case of Reconstruction, from the perspective of, uh, of, of, of African Americans, who, of course, were newly emancipated and were struggling with the realities of life in the South after the American Civil War. And the awareness of the, of, of how one's perspective or how one's understanding of a period alters um, based on sort of the lens that you're using to examine it is something that I think 
the only way that you can guard against that or, or, or perhaps guard against it is too negative a way mm-hmm. of describing it. I think it actually can be a quite strikingly creative aspect of, of looking at a period, to be aware of where you're standing. But I think it's the awareness that you stand in a particular place and are, are, are examining a period or a person or, or a tradition or what have you from a particular lens is, is perhaps the best way to guard against exaggeration or um, some more grandiose claim than really is warranted by the evidence. Well, that makes sense, Paul. Um, what, what did you think of 12 Years a Slave? Well, I'm so glad that you asked me about 12 Years a Slave because um, obviously it has received a great deal of attention. Um, and what's, what's in my case, what's interesting is that I was I was first introduced to Solomon Northup and the narrative Twelve Years a Slave because I taught for two years in South Louisiana at a branch campus of Louisiana State University. Before I came to Saginaw, after I got my PhD, I went and taught for two years in South Louisiana. And one of my colleagues there uh, knew that I was teaching a course on uh, early American history and suggested that I use what at the time was a little known slave narrative. There are, there, you know, in the 1990s, much more famous slave narratives were written by Frederick Douglass, for example, or uh, a woman, uh, a slave woman named Harriet Jacobs. Those were the most famous narratives that were assigned in most college classrooms. Uh-huh. 12, year, 12 Years a Slave was not very well known. And so I read it and was absolutely bowled over by the power of the narrative. Um, here was a free man who was tricked and kidnapped and sold into slavery. Um, you know, it was, a, it was a really a striking narrative. So I, I have, I've been assigning that book to classes. My wife also assigns it. She's also a professor at Saginaw Valley. She's assigned it as well for years. And so when we found out that it was being made into a movie, um, you know, we were both very excited. We went to see the film. We also read or listened to interviews with the, the director and some of the actors. And in many ways, it is, a, it is an amazing film. Um, I think it is, it is better than many, many films that deal with American slavery. Um, I think there, there, aren't, there aren't very many films that deal forthrightly with the history of slavery in yeah. the United States. The film Amistad is one ex- exception to that. Mm-hmm. Uh, and this film very, very much deals forthrightly with the film. Um, and one of the things that it's very good at is, is, is showing the terrible violence of, of slavery. Yeah. Um, and I think it deals very forthrightly with it. My only, I'll be honest, the only criticism I have of the, of the film is that it tends to uh, describe slaveholders almost as psychopaths. In other words, one of the main characters is Edwin Epps, who is owns Solomon Northup. Northup works for him as a slave for much of the time that he's enslaved in Louisiana. And in the film, Epps is described as sort of a, a psychopathic figure. He's, yeah. he's uh, horrifically violent. Um, in the narrative, Edwin Epps is not a psychopath. He's a, he's a slaveholder. Uh, uh, he's, a, he's particularly brutal. He's often violent. But I think one of the risks that we run when we describe slaveholders as psychopaths as Epps is, I, I think, that's the way I interpret the, the description of him in the film, is that we, we run the risk of not understanding that violence was actually part of the everyday reality of slavery. Yeah, I can relate to that very much. Yeah. Um, he, he was a bit like a cardboard cutout in a way, wasn't he? Yeah. But just changing the subject slightly, but uh, I think relatedly, uh, I don't know if you've ever seen the film uh, Downfall about the last few days of Hitler's uh, time in the bunker. And what was really powerful about that film, they showed... Hitler as uh, being kind to his staff and uh, liking his dog. And, and, he, and they showed also that he was, uh, had some very dysfunctional and, uh, views and was very brutal. They also showed him as a human being, which in fact made it more chilling because you could, in a sense, identify with him to an extent. And I think, I think maybe the point you're making is that with this, this guy that, that was as a psychopath, you, you couldn't really relate to him as another human being in a way. I think that's exactly, that's exactly right. Uh, I mean, I have read, and just doing research on this period, I've read the letters of slaveholders, and um, 
while of course the institution of slavery was a horrifically violent and, and brutal and horrible system, they were they were they were regular human beings practicing it, and 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 I I think that that the, the way to understand slavery, you know, in a more uh, more nuanced way, and maybe a way that does more justice to the actual day to day experience, is that you know this the, the, the slaveholders meted out violence um, as a matter of course. They they rarely questioned it. Um, it didn't take a psychopath, <laughs> you know. To, to be a brutal and violent slaveholder. It was part and parcel of the everyday way in which the system uh, worked. And I think, yes, that Epps comes across in the film as, as uh, yes, as a cardboard cutout. I think that's a very good way of describing it. So that's my only criticism of, of the film. I think there were many other very, very good um, elements of the, of the film, um, particularly the way in which it, it describes the special problems that enslaved women faced. On plantations in the south. Yeah, they were they were between a rock and a hard place, weren't they? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, how much when when you are teaching history is it about telling a story? Well, I I do I do tend to be somewhat more traditional in my pedagogical methods in the classroom because. Um, I, I do lecture quite a bit in my classes. Um, one of the trends these days in, in uh, higher education, at least in the U.S., maybe true in Britain as well, is is, is to use uh, sort of group projects or group work in the classroom. And I do do some of that because I do think it helps students to, particularly if you're working with original sources from the period, to kind of try to work through those. But I do tend to lecture, uh, and my lectures do... Uh, have a kind of narrative element to them. Um, and so I do tell stories, and I, I try to, as much as possible, through the use of stories, I try to bring out the everyday reality, the day-to-day -day experiences of people in the past so that they can be understood, you know, as human beings. And so I focus a lot on on motivation um, and the consequences of action, uh, how people adjusted their beliefs in relation to experiences. And I think stories are a way to bring that element of the past. And, and students, I think, relate to that very well. Uh, when they begin to see through the telling of story that, that the people they're studying are flesh and blood human beings like themselves, history becomes less abstract and I think more personal and, and more real. Yeah. Uh, so I, I think that history is about telling stories. It's just always important, and I do this whenever I tell stories in my classes, is to always be aware that the story that you're telling is not the only story that could be told about the subject you're examining. Yeah. So I, and so I think it's very, and students, so I'll use words in my classes like, oh, I would argue, or from my, from my experience with the sources of this period, I would say, so I try always to be very open and honest about the limits of, of the particular narrative that I'm telling, but I do believe that narrative and the telling of stories can be a very important tool in helping students to understand uh, interpretation of the past. Well, finally, uh, Paul, you've touched on the idea of provisionality there. Um, what, what is your understanding of the middle way, and how does it relate to uh, to what we've been talking about today? Yes. Um, well, I would say, to me, my understanding of the middle way is, is I guess, fairly um, simple in the sense that it is the avoidance of dogmatic extremes and the ways in which dogmatic extremes, when human beings embrace them, um, distort reality, yeah. and that those distortions of reality sometimes lead to human actions that can be terribly destructive. And I think that, um, you know, we see this in, in many ways. We see this in fundamentalist religion. We see it in the ways in which political ideology can often distort reality, sometimes even intentionally distort reality, which of course leads to various forms of polarization and a, a, a ways of seeing other people as somehow less than fully human. Um, so to me, the, the middle way is about, is, a, is, a, is an avoidance of extreme dogmatic positions, a kind of humility when it comes to any forms of metaphysical assertion or certainty. Yeah. Um, and it's it's a certain kind of openness to to new experience or a willingness to modify uh, 
existing belief in light of experience. And I think that history, uh, you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of places in the past where you can see the results of um, of dogmatic certainty. Um, you know, so much of human conflict, I think, in the past has been uh, generated by dogmatic certainties, whether it's about nationalism, whether it's about religion, whether it's about economic systems, or what have you. I think that you see the danger uh, that that often dogmatic certainty or metaphysical certainty can create. So. So for me, history is a very powerful tool in reinforcing the importance of openness to experience and, and a kind of a critical attitude toward, uh, toward dogmatic or metaphysical certainties. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Paul. It's been really interesting today. Well, thank you so much for having me. I, I enjoyed it. You can find out more about Middle Way Philosophy at www.middlewaysociety.org.